For the past few weeks, during our sermons, we've been making references, sometimes obvious ones and sometimes a little more subtle, to a song written by Matthew West called My Own Little World. In that, in that song, he talks about how he'd spent most of his life not really paying much attention to people around him and not, not doing anything really beyond his own little world. Everything he did was to kind of keep him safe within his own little world. But then in the song, he goes on to describe a day when he's just driving in his car and he stops at a light. And for whatever reason, he happened to look out his window and he saw someone there holding a brown cardboard sign. And then his gaze shifted upward and he saw the face of the person holding that sign. And at that moment, something broke through in his life. And he thought to himself, God, what have I been doing? What have I been doing? And then he goes on, he starts seeing all kinds of people who are struggling all around him. A mom with a young child, a man walking down the street carrying a cardboard box full of files, apparently just lost his job. A man on the side of the road with a broken down car. A woman sitting on a park bench reading a letter and looking more and more upset. He sees all this now and he wonders, what have I been doing? Oh Lord, what have I been doing? God's heart breaks for all who are in times of struggle and pain. He sees that and he responds, I'm going to break my heart for what breaks yours, O oh Lord. He's got a whole different perspective. As we heard from 1 Corinthians, from Janet, when one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. That's so true. At least we want it to be true, those of us who follow Jesus. It seems like in the past few weeks, there has been an outpouring of pain recently. It really came home to me last Sunday when we brought forward those prayer shawls and it was heaped high with 10 people or families in a really hard place in their lives, needing God's comfort. And we've heard other stories too about the students in Dover who have died just recently. And that gives me flashbacks to about a year and a half ago when here in this sanctuary we held a funeral service for young Abby Lizotte who died of an accidental overdose. This place was packed full of kids, people in their 20s looking totally distraught, in so much pain. And I looked at them from here and my heart just broke for them. Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? When we suddenly start to see the faces around us of people who are struggling and in pain. So I was kind of glad that this last week, I, I looked at the calendar and last Monday I saw that I was off to go to a clergy gathering. The bishop offers these through our different locations to help the clergy get ready for Lent, to kind of get us spiritually grounded. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm ready for that. I've seen so much pain and suffering, I need something to kind of help me move forward. I was also pretty excited because the speaker that day was Elaine Heath. She's a professor at Duke and has written a number of books which I have read and really enjoyed. And I was pretty excited. I came prepared. I brought one of my little books that she wrote, Five Means of Grace, Experience God's Love the Wesleyan Way. And I was a real groupie and I got her to sign it for me. I felt pretty goofy, but I'm pretty happy about it. So I was feeling pretty good there at this gathering of clergy, getting ready to hear what Dr. Heath was going to say to us. And she said a number of things, but something in particular caught my eye, and it was a picture, which I think Todd's going to put on the screen for us now. 
It's a little hard to see. This is a Russian icon. In the middle is Jesus, right there. And he, you can kind of see he's got his hands extended downward. And he's, these are two caskets. She said that they were Adam and Eve. I'm not quite sure how she knew that. They're not wearing fig leaves. <laughs> but I'll take her word for it. And then I wish you could see this down below, but down here is a pit. And you can kind of dimly see people's faces there and chains that are holding them down. She said, that's hell. She said, you know, it's funny, we don't talk about hell very much. The Apostles' Creed, which we read frequently at the second service, doesn't say anything about hell. It says that Jesus was born the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. It skips over something, and if you look closely in those hymnals in your pews, those purple ones, on number 881, I believe, there's a little asterisk, and it says, traditional use of this creed includes these words, he descended into hell. We actually got to talking about this during our confirmation planning last fall. And some of us were very surprised that he descended into hell wasn't included in the Apostles' Creed. Some people in other churches use those words all the time. Presbyterians, Episcopalians, among others. Other churches don't recite the creed at all. They don't have anything against it, they just don't recite it. That would be Congregationalists, I suspect Baptists and others from the free church tradition. But we Methodists, we have it right there in our hymnal with the little asterisk. I got to thinking about this some more after seeing this painting. And so I knew that Guy Eaton has a beloved old Methodist hymnal. I got to wondering what was in his hymnal, so I asked. And it's not there in his 1939 Methodist hymnal. So then I had to do more research, and I found out that it was included in the 1966 Methodist hymnal, but again with a little asterisk. Apparently, we stopped printing the whole thing and saying the whole thing around 1905, maybe 1935. I'm not quite sure why that is. I think my guess is that it became unfashionable to talk about hell. Maybe we didn't want to get associated with those hellfire preaching pastors out there, and we wanted to look a little more civilized. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that John Wesley was not afraid to include that when he recited the Apostles' Creed. He would say, Jesus died and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. It is biblical. In First Peter and other places, it talks about Jesus descending into hell. Well, that's all very good and fine, I suppose, if you like historical trivia. Why on earth am I talking about all this? I'm talking about it because I saw this picture and it got me to thinking some more. Because Jesus descended into hell. And he did that to get people out of it. He came to, pro to proclaim release to the captives. As Luke said, quoting Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and let the oppressed go free. He knew, Jesus knew, that people were in hell and he wanted to get them out. Years ago, I, I heard an, another pastor say, oh yeah, I believe in hell. Of course I do, I've been there myself. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there now, I don't know. But I believe that that breaks God's heart. And I believe that God sent Jesus to get us the hell out. Don't let my mother watch this sermon. <laughs> She sent me to church in shiny patent black shoes and little white gloves. And we didn't talk about hell. Actually, I think she could handle it now. 
As followers of Jesus, God calls you and me to have the guts to get to people who are suffering, to do whatever we can to get them out of that hell, whatever hell that is that they're experiencing. We're called as followers of Jesus to go to hell too. Dr. Heath was talking about all these things on Monday and she said, you know, in our denomination, the United Methodist Church, we've got this long mission statement that says that we're called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And that sounds fabulous, and it is fabulous. But she said, you know, we could abbreviate it. We could just say our mission is to go to hell. <laughs> Other people have done it. Karl Barth, who's a highly regarded theologian from the 20th century who lived in Switzerland. He was a professor of theology at the university, but he also preached release to the captives, to anyone in times of hell. He preached to the churches of Germany about the duty of the church under a tyrant like Hitler. He also preached to the inmates of the local prison, and some of them actually printed his sermons in the print shop there so that others of us could read them later. We know other people who dare to go to hellish places. Julian Olivier, who's the chaplain at the local prison, goes there all the time. So do other prison chaplains. Our own Minette Nduisi goes to jail all the time. She teaches anger management classes there and other classes and she helps people when they're about to get released to tr get ready to transition back into the regular world out here with you and me. Others hear God's call to go to other places to release God's people who are trapped and held captive in hellish places. All those people are following Jesus and doing what Jesus did when he descended into hell. And so I invite all of us in the coming days to keep our eyes open, to look for things and people and places that break our hearts, and to consider, does that mean that God is calling us to go there too, to proclaim release to those who are held captive in those places? I want to close with a story that a few of you have heard me tell before. It's because it's one of my favorite stories. There was a man who was out walking through a cemetery. It was late at night. I don't know why he was there. But all of a sudden, he fell into a deep, deep hole. It was dark and cold and frightening. And he started calling out, help me, help me, somebody, get me out of here. And he waited and waited, and finally, somebody heard him. And he came to the edge of the hole and peered down, and he said, I'm down here, get me out. And the man looked at him, and the man jumped into the hole. And the first guy said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Now we're both stuck down here in this horrible, hellish hole. And the man looked at him with love and said, I've been down here before, and I know the way out. Amen.